So welcome to the ARDC Projects Exchange 2021, which has the theme Collaboration for Impact. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, so I'm acknowledging and paying respect to the Turbal and Yagara people. Today's session is the first of a series of sessions over the next week where we'll be hearing from the project leads of ARDC co-investment partners for our National Data Assets and Platforms programs. So it's a chance to hear about each other's projects and plans and an opportunity to better coordinate and connect on common challenges that might arise during the delivery of these projects over the next couple of years. So this, this session is the kickoff to kick off our exchange and our ex speakers are Rosie Hicks, who's our CEO, Andrew Trelaw, who's the Director of Platforms and Software, and Adrian Burton, who's the Director of Data Policy and Services at ARDC. And they are going to provide you with an overview of the ARDC's intent in developing these programs an orientation to the co-investment partnership and the way in which ARDC can add value to your projects. We're going to begin with Rosie and then we'll hear from Andrew and Adrian and a bit of time at Q&A at the end. And I'm fully aware, and we're all fully aware that it's a Friday afternoon, so uh, we may not last the full hour. Uh, we'll see how we go. So over to you, Rosie. Lovely. Thanks very much, Natasha. And uh, if any problems with the audio, then sing out. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, lovely to see you here this afternoon. And the next few moments I'm going to spend uh, going over something that I am sure you're already familiar with. But I do think it helps set the scene for this afternoon, which is really taking us in much deeper to collaborative partnerships for impact. So first of all, uh, as you know, ARDC was incorporated just in 2019 and building on the amazing foundations of and Nectar and RDS, but it was a lot to bring together. And so we spent some time thinking about the purpose really simply. Our purpose is to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. And how do we go about doing that? What's our mission? Well, we're driving research uh, excel and accelerating, in it, sorry, we're accelerating research and innovation by driving excellence. And I am now handing over to Andrew to continue. We're very focused on providing a competitive advantage for day through data. And part of that is, in fact, a significant part of that is the need to make available high quality data assets and importantly make it possible for people to do things with those high quality data assets so uh, those of you that remember the 2016 roadmap you, you may know that we're in the throes of starting out on the uh, the next roadmap but for those of us that think of the roadmap and remember 2016 the 2016 roadmap had a significant emphasis on the importance of data um, I'm hoping that they won't in 2021 say, yeah, that, that, that we've got that all sorted, we can move on to other challenges, because that is not true. There are significant data related challenges for us to tackle. And in terms of what we're doing and how we relate to that, we've got two programs of activity. So one is around creating a collection of high quality national data assets that can be used across disciplines to solve particular challenges. Adrian will talk more about those in a minute. But we are also interested in making it possible for people to do things with those data. And of course, as the data volumes increase, the need to use sophisticated tools and indeed sophisticated collaborative environments to work with that data becomes more and more important. One of the things that we've been emphasizing increasingly over the life of the ARDC is the importance of fairness. Uh, and you'll hear the and see the FAIR acronym cropping up in all sorts of places in ARDC's messaging. But we're particularly interested in the reuse of data and the reusability of data. 
And of course, the findability, the accessibility, the interoperability are all in service of the ultimate reusability and indeed reuse. Um, and as you'll hear in a little while, we're interested in looking to expand out the idea of FAIR beyond just data. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. You'll have heard Rosie talk not about us ARDC funding projects, but about us co-investing in projects. And that's something that I really want to emphasize today and hopefully something that you'll hear as a consistent messaging thread through the interactions you have with the ARDC. So we, we really don't want to be seen as a funder. We don't see ourselves as a funder. We very much see ourselves as co-investors in things that you care about and that we care about, and indeed that we believe Australia should care about. So we are consistently trying to talk about co-investment and the co-investment process and the co-investment message. Now, in the case of some of the programs that we invested in last year, we had, uh, sorry, in, well, we invested in them last year, we ran the programs in 2019, we had quite strict requirements. Those of you that submitted uh, proposals against the 2019 platforms open call will remember that we had a mandatory one-to-one -one or greater co-investment requirement. We did that for two reasons, to be clear. One was this desire that we be seen not just as funders, that we be seen as co-investors. But secondly, we believed then and still believe that if there are co-investors in the project, the projects are more likely to be sustained beyond the end of the initial injection of ARDC funding. So that's why we, we really pushed hard that one-to-one -one co investment message in the 2019 open calls. In 2020, of course, uh, 2020, you may remember, was slightly different to 2019 uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons, of course, thanks COVID, was that the institutions that were often co-investors in our programs uh, had significant financial um, headwinds. And as a result, we relaxed that one-to-one -one co investment requirement. So those of you that uh, applied for the National Data Assets Program, for instance, will not have had a one-to-one -one co investment requirement. Uh, so, but, but we still believe that co investment is important. So the first, the first message is co-investment's important. The second message is that we don't just see that what ARDC is bringing to the table is money. We also believe that we are there to contribute expertise and effort. So Rosie, I've rolled on past your stuff into my stuff, if that's okay. Um, so we, we very much believe that we have expertise and effort that we're able to contribute and that we want to contribute. Uh, so that we want the projects to be seen as a co-creation process, something where we, we all have an investment in its success. I mentioned that we've been talking about ARDC's requirements around FAIR, and we've been quite strong for a while on the importance of the data that is being brought together in the National Data Assets Projects, or indeed the data that is being produced out of the platforms that we're also investing in, that that data be fair. But we're also interested in exploring what fair might mean in other contexts. So uh, we're in the process of working through with the platforms community, what it might mean to have fair platforms. Now this is an extension to where fair came from. Uh, it's work that no one really else in the world is doing. Uh, we have international colleagues who are looking at that and saying, oh, that's an interesting idea, let us know how it goes. So we're exploring the idea of how you might make e-research platforms more findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable. And you will have heard in the introduction that I'm responsible for our DC's activities in platforms and software. We're also looking at what FAIR might mean for software, but there we are contributing to international activity rather than leading it ourselves. So there is an international working group led through the Research Data Alliance, which is looking at what FAIR might mean for software, called imaginatively FAIR for research software, FAIR for RS. 
Um, Tom Honeyman, the software uh, program lead, is involved in a number of the task groups for that. Uh, it's been jointly led by RDA, GoFair, uh, and CoData, oh, and RISA, uh, the Research Software Alliance. Uh, and if you're interested at all in what FAIR might mean for software, I'd encourage you to have a look at that group. Um, if you can't find information, please ping me and I, I can send it to you. Uh, so, um, so you'll see this increasing uh, emphasis on the importance of FAIR across all of the things that we're investing in. And then lastly, um, before I move on to programs specifically, I should say that one of the things you'll see in the way we interact with you in your programs is we're very interested in governance. In fact, in our all staff meeting yesterday, we had a number of our staff who were getting extremely excited about governance. Uh, I think indeed one of the people who works for Adrian was almost going so far as to say governance was the most important thing we did. Um, he's wrong, but uh, I applaud his useful enthusiasm. But um, governance is certainly very critical, and you'll see that we are very keen that the projects that we're all involved in has strong governance arrangements and that we are represented on those governance arrangements. So that's, I think, as much as I wanted to say on co-investment. Rosie, was there anything you wanted to hammer home even further on that before I move on to the wonderful world of platforms? Um, thanks, Andrew. Everyone, I'm so sorry I had to step out mid-sentence there, um, but I'm assuming that uh, Andrew has done a, a wonderful job of uh, concluding with the, the CEO's comments. And if I may take just a moment to say um, really that I think we're at an amazingly exciting time moving um, this, this massively increasing demand for the type of work you're doing uh, really into the mainstream, and it's a fabulous opportunity for us coming together uh, to collaborate this afternoon. That was the thrust of it. I'm sure Andrew conveyed that, um, but I'm really looking forward to um, the rest of the Zoom, the rest of the WebEx session. Yeah, I would have it die hard. We're just so used to thinking of Zoom, but that's okay. We'll mental flexibility, Rosie. Um, okay, so let me talk about platforms. Uh, before I pass to Adrian to talk about uh, national data assets. So platforms, unfortunately, is one of those overloaded words. Uh, Anitha Cannon, who I see on the call, is responsible for the platforms activity at Monash University, and they use platforms in a slightly different way to the way we use it. Um, we're defining platforms here as a set of services. So these are machine accessible services, often that have associated uh, data integration or service orchestration functions or connections to data resources where the goal is to enable researchers to carry out some of their research activities more easily. So you can think of them as a, an aggregation of tools and services to make life easier for researchers. This is, of course, in, um, in support of this overarching goal of giving Australian researchers this competitive advantage through data. The goal for the ARDC investment in platforms is we're really trying to enable transformative research. So we're, we're not just trying to do more of the same, we want to enable researchers to transform how they work. And in the two open calls that we've run with platforms, we've emphasized transformations in the kind of research that could be done. So enabling researchers to tackle problems that they couldn't tackle before and transformations in the speed of research, that is enabling researchers to do things much more quickly, an order of magnitude, let's say, than they could have before. We've got uh, particular sub-goals. Uh, we'd like more researchers in more disciplines to have access to these kinds of platforms. So Nectar, one of the predecessor organisations to ARDC, invested in a particular set of uh, platforms. We've been seeking to broaden out the remit of platforms and um, make them available to a wider range of researchers in a wider range of disciplines. And the platforms we invested in at the end of last year, I think, reflect that. But going back to this theme of um, sustainability that I picked up when I was talking about co-investment, we'd also like the community of platforms, developers and managers to be more sustainable. And so one of the thrusts that you'll see in 
what how we engage with our existing platforms projects is how do you build a sustainable community of people that share best practice um, that um, help one another to work more effectively um, that possibly even exchange developers if developers have particular skill sets so there's a, a very strong emphasis on um, that, that sustainability of the community. Um, I note with some concern that Adrian has wandered off just at his point of the agenda. Uh, Natasha, would you like to tell us something about, or possibly Adrian, would you like to tell us something about the awesomeness that is the National Data Assets Program? See the National Data Assets, good. Thank, yes, the other uh, wing of the, uh, Current ARDC uh, co-investments is the National Data Assets. Um, it comes from an NCRIS, uh, this is an NCRIS, you know, where ARDC is part of NCRIS, and this is an NCRIS program. We are planning through this National Data Assets program to build nationally significant data assets that will support uh, leading edge research. So that's how it fits in as part of a, a, the NCRIS uh, principles and the NCRIS um, uh, ethos. Uh, in this area, it just means that you know, there are lots of data, there's lots of data around, there's lots of data assets around. Uh, we particularly have partnered with uh, the ones with, that are complex national partnerships. So that's that nationally significant thing because then Chris uh, acknowledges the great role that um, local infrastructure and um, you know, plays. Uh, however, it's our role to get involved in those uh, national data assets that are uh, inherently cross institution and cross jurisdiction. Um, and they are the ones actually that are quite complex and need quite a, a, a bit of support and the ARDC is a, a logical uh, partner for them. The program logic for the uh, uh, National Data Assets Program is fairly simple. Uh, the inputs, so I'll just take it across, the, it's a, a program logic model that has input, activity, output, outcome and impacts. Um, in general, what we're, the whole set of resources and expertise and existing assets come from both the ARDC and the, a set of partner organisations. Um, the activity then in general is to build that data infrastructure and um, importantly, uh, to populate it with uh, real content that has been built on consensus and standards. Um, again, both these activities are ARDC and you know, the, the partner projects in collaboration working there. The typical output we're looking from an, uh, for a, a national data assets uh, project is that there is a new national data infrastructure and it is available. Uh, it's important as we move on that we you know, that the outcome come, the outcome actually refers back to the whole NCRIS principle that this data infrastructure should be then used by Australian researchers for leading edge research. So it needs, you know, that's the, uh, these outcomes sort of direct uh, the priorities, et cetera, of the projects and the program. And then the longer term impact is that, you know, this, when this research is done um, with the new national data infrastructure, that that research um, will bring you know, economic and social and environmental uh, benefits for Australia. So that's the general uh, program logic that sort of sets out you know, how and how and what we're trying to achieve uh, with this program. Um, I'll just move on, seeing as though Natasha said the theme was Friday afternoon, and let's get straight to the point. Um, we also, so in general across all our programs, so the platforms as well as the uh, national data assets and everything we do, um, there is an element of ARDC uh, project support. We've uh, been informed by Bunnings um, to where 
our project investment is just the beginning and uh, it's the beginning of a long-term partnership with uh, the groups involved uh, where we continue to provide a whole set of other um, value-add inputs to the projects. I'll just go through, go through some of them. This is by no means um, exclusive. Um, where ARDC has uh, underpinning, operates underpinning infrastructure and uh, facilitates uh, infrastructure in the area of cloud and storage. And uh, we'll be in touch if, you pro if your project is just beginning, we'll be in touch to just sort of get an idea of what your technology requirements are and what they might be in these areas. Uh, ARDC can help where you're not obliged to uh, take our help in, in, in any of these areas, but we can help, we do, we can provide allocations of cloud and, and storage. Uh, obviously, it has to be suitable for what you need and, and, and from our side of it, we have to be able to, you know, actually it must be feasible for us to provide that, but we can look at specialist needs uh, if necessary, but that's uh, that'll be a conversation between us and you. Um, there is a storage infrastructure thing that I just uh, bring your attention to. You'll get more communications from us uh, in the next little while, but it is time sensitive. Uh, the ARDC has just launched a stage two data retention program that is not targeted at projects like yours. It's targeted at institutions and NCRIS facilities. However, a good deal of you actually have, you know, some of your storage requirements would have been um, are taken care of by Australian research institutions and NCRIS facilities. If that's the case, I would get in touch with them and uh, we'll give you the information. You draw them, draw their attention to this uh, data retention program that we have. And your collection could be um, uh, included uh, as part of an, uh, an institutional package that we would be uh, developing um, with your institution or with an NCRIS facility. So uh, just uh, don't worry if you don't understand all of that, but we will be in touch with the projects just to, to draw your attention to that. And the idea is it's not direct support for your individual project, but it is uh, storage support that we can uh, provide um, to an institution or a facility that might well be already uh, uh, interested in supporting you as far as storage is concerned. Um, we have a whole set of information services by which you can get access to persistent identifiers like DOIs and uh, a whole range. If you have physical samples in your projects, we have identifiers that can be used for physical samples. We have a lot of assistance in uh, publishing metadata and syndicating the, the descriptions of your uh, data collections and other software uh, items and other things. Uh, and we have a, a whole set of information services around the publishing and the reuse of uh, specific scientific and research concepts. So in uh, standardized vocabularies, again, uh, you'll you'll hear more about this from us later, but just to say that we have those services and all our projects are uh, eligible to use those services uh, and there is no charge for those. Um, we have also informatics expert support for all the above. So if you didn't even understand what I was talking about, a, a, a standardized vocabulary, um, don't worry, we actually have staff, etc., who can come into your project and look at it and say, well, maybe you could actually uh, use that. And if you're interested in any of those areas, we have uh, experts who've been working in this for a number of years that can help the projects in those areas. And more broadly, in you know, what it means to be fair, you know, what it is to do that kind of data management for uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse. Uh, we have experts on our team that can work with you. Um, we have other kinds of experts that are not in that kind of informatics and information sharing, but right down at the systems development, because uh, almost all of your projects will be developing some kind of an IT system as a, as a core. Um, and we have uh, experts that can help in the data systems architecture, uh, platforms architecture and analysis and support. And again, we'll be in touch. And um, for example, if you have a, um, 
a technical advisory group or team uh, committee in your project, uh, we'd have someone who could sit there and uh, as an observer and help uh, as required. Um, we also, Andrew ref, uh, talked about um, broader things that the, that enable projects in general, we call those sort of enabling frameworks that include governance and strategy agreements, policy, uh, and we're uh, developing that uh, as a capability to, to support the projects. Uh, and in, ver in, in everything that we do, the last stop point is important. Um, I've talked about what we can do for the projects. You know, we are an amazing organization, but uh, we certainly don't have the answers to everything. And a lot of the experts are right here on the call. Uh, and so uh, probably the major thing that we'll be able to do for your projects is this cross project coordination and pollination. We'll be starting up a number of working groups and other sort of clusters, et cetera, to uh, share information across the projects. So if you have any ideas uh, in that area, please sort of be proactive and sort of suggest to us. What I try to get across today is that we are here to uh, support and be part of the projects. If there's things that you think you need, then uh, get into contact with your liaison and we'll try and develop that into the future. So I think that was all from me. Uh, do we hand back? Yeah, let me stop. You hand back to me. And back to Natasha, is that right? Yep, that's right. Thank you, Adrian, Andrew. Thank you, Rosie. Um, great. So a chance for you to ask questions. Um, there is a question there. Uh, it's directed at Andrew, but I think um, Adrian may want to speak to that one as well. Uh, what about, it's from Steve McGeckin. Um, Steve, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to add uh, anything. I just uh, the question was about fair vocabularies and linking into the work that Simon Cox is doing on the 10 simple rules for fair vocabularies, which is in preprint at the moment. It's actually a topic of discussion at the NISO conference this week, which uh, at, at a session which the ARDC ran with Simon, actually. Um, but we would like to answer that where this where the fair vocabs fits in. Uh, well, Andrew introduced the fact that ARDC is interested in applying FAIR to a whole set of other things, so that's correct. Uh, yes, and, and vocabularies as well. So if you have a list of important concepts that are, that are the backbone of uh, standardization for your data collection or, or anything in your uh, systems, um, then this uh, ARDC actually runs a, a service there that is meant to be able to make those uh, standard concepts and standard lists um, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And yes, we're working very, very closely with Simon um, and with you, Steve, uh, in, in that effort. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That is a, uh, another important element of uh, the fairness of everything. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I am not seeing any other questions in the chat. I can't see everybody. If this is your chance to unmute and ask a question, I'll just give you a little bit of time if anyone would like to. I can see Lujin there from Black Mountain. Yep. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, uh, yep, I'm, I'm just sort of, this is Lou from Atlas Blue Australia. So I just have a general question sort of direct to anyone from our disease management that sort of wishes to uh, um, address that. Uh, I guess sort of the new kind of way to work with RDC is to see RDC as a co-investor, not a not a grant agency, right? So you're really a partner of the project. And um, so I, I guess sort of my question is how detailed would you like to be to be involved in the delivery of the project? Is because there can be, for example, you can you can either be uh, sitting on the governance body and be an uh, sort of oversight of the whole thing to actually get to be part of the sort of decision making in the day-to-day -day operations of project management, right? I, I guess, I, I guess how, how detailed would you like to be involved in each of the project deliveries? Excellent question. I'm gonna go Rosie first as the highest ranking officer. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, for bringing up um, that, that question. And Natasha, thanks for giving me the answer to respond because I am going to respond at a higher level. Um, ARDC has never been a funding agency. 
there have just been issues around the way that projects have been selected uh, from a, a highly competitive space. Mm. But what makes the organisation and indeed other NCRIS organisations so special is actually the staff, the people, the staff cohort and the expertise. And so the fact that we hire people, as Adrian said, that are deep experts uh, in all things fair, um, just to, to take a, a simple snapshot there, um, we don't hire them just to check reports and compliance. So from that philosophical position, we have uh, a fantastic cohort of staff with deep knowledge in this space. The only limit to uh, participating in the projects is obviously bandwidth. Um, so we will do our best to contribute intellectually and deeply to the projects uh, to the full extent of our resources. Going forward, we're looking at how we um, adjust our own organisational model um, and increase our staff cohort to further deepen um, the collaborations that we have for each of the projects. Um, so I, I think what I'm giving is the, the um, deeply held belief and philosophy of how we would like to see ourselves in this conversation. Great, thank you, Rosie. And thank you, thank you, Rosie, that's great. Sorry, a uh, bit of a lag time there. Uh, Andrew, you want to add something to that? Yeah, and if I can perhaps provide a, um, a specific example that is, of course, completely consistent with what Rosie has just said. Uh, for the platforms projects, uh, one of the things that we have been offering to the platforms projects, both the 2019 and the 2020 open calls, is some expertise uh, housed in Adrian's group, and indeed housed within the person of John Smiley in Adrian's group. Uh, so he uh, came to us with significant expertise around architecture and design of large data systems. And we have been um, effectively lending him out to the platforms projects initially to do a, uh, a, a kind of an overview of their technical architectures and the technical approaches they were taking, looking at it and saying, well, Okay, I noticed you're using this approach. Had you thought about doing things this way? Or uh, were you aware that uh, there are later versions of this particular solution that interoperate in these ways? And of course, as he did more of those, he was starting, he was able to identify points of intersection and points of uh, collaboration between those projects. Ah, you're trying to solve this particular problem that project over there is also trying to solve that problem. You should talk to them. So that's, if you like, at one level. But in the case of one of our platforms projects, the Eco Commons platforms project, he's actually really rolled his sleeves up and got involved in a very detailed architecture review that they are undertaking and has been very much a co-creator of their new architecture. Now, obviously, that's to go back to Rosie's point about bandwidth and resource. That's a significant involvement, and we probably don't have the ability for John to do all of those unless Adrian's secret plan to clone him is uh, going to pay off faster than we thought. Uh, but that's the that's an instance of the the sort of deep engagement uh, that we are prepared to make um, where it's going to demonstrate real benefit. Thank you, Andrew. I think that's really clear answers, and thank you, Rosie, as well. That's great. Thank you for that question, Lujin. I think a lot of people may have had that question in mind as well. Um, okay, so there's a question from Ivan Hannigan, and he is asking, he's interested in your views of the major impacts the COVID pandemic will have for data science and research. So for human health and social science, there are now new ways to collect data on individual home locations and travel movements, or will Australians be more likely to allow private data to be used to support research policy, research and policy that's in line for disaster preparedness? If so, what are the implications for our data security systems? Wow, that's a big, that is the topic of a webinar. Who would like to start with the presentation? Andrew, jump in. Um. 
So I'm cautiously encouraged that 85% of Australians are now prepared to have a, an anti-COVID vaccine, which suggests a, a degree of um, openness to moving outside the comfort zone that may not have been around last year. Uh, the issue of private data and the issue of data security and indeed the issue of how we work with sensitive data is one that's come up over and again. Um, Adrian has in his team uh, a guy called Kristen Kang, who's particularly focused on the challenges around sensitive data. But I was wondering whether Steve McKechn would like to briefly talk about the wonders of the five safes approach, which is being explored in the Cadre project. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> where do I start? Um, well, I mean, if, 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 if we're talking about uh, yeah. data security and private data, you know, five safes yeah. is where I naturally go to. Yeah, and I think that's probably the model we, we probably want to think about. So for those folks who aren't aware, there's the um, the five safe model says, you know, how do you think about safety of people, projects, data, settings and outputs uh, and how we might understand and monitor them. So the card rate project we're working on, how you might um, both describe those and, and incorporate those into some of the data access environments that you might use. Um, the interesting question that Ivan puts is, I think actually oriented around, do, will people trust us to use the data uh, effectively? Um, and I would say I'm, I'm inclined to put a counterpoint on, um, we're doing some work in the center of it right now, which is dealing with hesitancy to vaccinate. So, um, uh, so for those who are interested in reading, it's actually gone down the number of people who think they will vaccinate uh, rather than up, which is a little depressing. Yeah, um, but yeah, but the point there, I think about, th you know, sort of, the, I think the interesting question here will be um, the extent to which people are, what COVID might tell people about sort of the value of data in actually be able to support um, uh, some of the, you know, the research that we need to do to you know, keep everyone healthy and then and say contribute to that effort. I think that's quite an interesting sort of framework question that um, uh, that might guide some of our thinking. So that it, say there's some there's actually some quite interesting research to be done on willingness to participate in such programs um, as one of these called a cross cutting exercises um, uh, that, that that might be of interest. Um, basically, do people you know? How have people changed their views from 2016 when we had uh, census fail to now when you know where we can see the gains of, of possibly doing the sharing that's there? Mm. I just add um, question is about you know whether the COVID pandemic will you know perhaps provide some opportunities. Uh, I have heard experienced people say that you should never let a good disaster go un. Uh, Never let, never let a good crisis go to waste was Winston Churchill's yeah. line. Yeah, that's right. So unexploited for uh, strategic reasons. So, um, and the Christchurch, I know that the, someone did an actual study of the Christchurch earthquake um, disaster that actually uh, ended up having long-term uh, data sharing uh, improvements for the, uh, in that area there. Uh, so uh, you'd hope that that would be the case. And so I think people would be certainly more open and um, expect science to, to have a role in, in, in supporting that. I think this group here that's on the call today actually have a, the, the corresponding role to say, yes, and you can trust us to do it. Uh, and the kind of systems that you guys are gonna be building through these programs uh, are the ones that can say yes, then they've got the procedures and they've got the systems and they've they've got our interest in heart and those the uh, the interests of the public are reflected in these uh, systems uh, and you know that that will be a, a big part of uh, I think there will be an openness and so we've got a, a, a an opportunity to show that we can respond to that. Great, thank you. There's a couple of follow up comments from Ivan there in the chat, if you'd like to read them. Um, Natasha, uh, on the bushfire one, it might be worth Adrian very quickly talking about the translational research data challenge. Yes. Which one's this, the uh, smoke thing? Is that right? The yes. smoke? 
Yeah. Yes, yeah, but Ivan's involved in that. Uh, oh, okay. Bushfire Research Data Challenge, but uh, in parallel to this, the group of people who are on the call today, we have a, another set of uh, a different program where we're starting with the problem of uh, bushfires and then asking the question, okay, what kind of platforms and data and other things would be required for, for that? And um, the work that Ivan's sort of already preparing around uh, air quality in this program, we're taking a, a, almost as a given and an input into that second program, we're seeing how we can get on top of Great, thank you, Adrian. Um, so there's a question there from Q. Um, Hugh, I'm not sure if you'd like to unmute and ask that question yourself or if you'd like me to, to ask it. I'll just give you a minute if you'd like to ask it yourself, otherwise I will. Oh, okay. So he is interested in the ahead. working yep. groups. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Didn't give you long enough, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, okay. I, I just want to know um, who to ask um, or who to suggest uh, creating, you know, the creation of a, a working group. Who, who, where would I start if I want to create a working group across across these okay. ARDC people? Terrific, yes. Um, the question was addressed to me. I can tell you that the right person to talk to is Natasha, who's right there, and if she'd like to say anything further, I'll hand over to her. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Hugh. So we are hoping that through this uh, initial kickoff week with the projects exchange, that we will start to see some of those common challenges. And um, then from that, we can actually look at what interest groups we currently have, uh, whether we need some subgroups of those. For example, we have a sensitive data community of practice, but perhaps we actually need a specific subset on health data or you know we'll see what actually shakes out from the projects exchange um, but we already have a number of communities of in, uh, practice that we facilitate in ARDC that are part of the broader community looking at particular challenges in the data space um, which a lot of these projects will have a link into so I think we'll, we will explore that a bit more through the projects exchange um, through the discussion there and also uh, following that um, probably uh, about six weeks down the track or so we'd like to do a bit of an orientation to the ARDC um, data services and expertise and how you can hook into that so we'll fold it into that discussion as well. Um, but if you have thoughts, uh, you have a program manager that you can uh, get in touch with and we'll also make sure that that information is flowing out to you of what's currently available and how you can hook into those. Great, thank you, Hugh. Um, I do not see any other questions and we are just coming up towards quarter two. So I think we actually might close it off. And thank you all very, very much for giving up your time on a Friday afternoon to come. And um, thank you to Rosie, Adrian and Andrew for that uh, excellent information about uh, the ARDC co-investment and what it will mean for your projects. So as I mentioned, um, we're kicking off this is the first of the project exchange meetings. We have a number of them via Zoom, uh, one hour sessions next week, where we'll hear from each of the project leads, what's happening in their projects. We'll start to look at some of those common challenges in the discussion. Um, and as I mentioned, a little bit further down the track, we'll look at some specific se uh, um, sessions on how you can hook into the ARDC services infrastructure and expertise. So uh, thank you all again. Have a lovely weekend and um, bye all. <laughs>